So, hope you enjoyed that video. How the neutral star merger area was singled in and how the observations were made. It is really interesting topic and established this second possible R process site. So let me fully share screen slideshow from the current slide. Here must be ah oh, I should shift this stuff here down. Sorry. Okay, and towards the end, you have seen that this uh, table of isotopes again, but now different than we had before. So for example, I have now exploding massive stars up to crypto and rubidium. It's probably still extending further on. And then what is the Big Bang Cosmic, which we had previously, they have now a new merging neutron stars a lot. And of course, exploding white dwarf. So up to the iron sink region, but the dying low mass stars, this cannot be, that must be dying high mass stars, because otherwise we don't get really these reactions for the, the slow neutron capture process. And what I don't like about this map here is it's again an ether or that everything is known happening uh, only neutron star mergers because one has observed one but should now first of all of course in order to get a neutron star we need an ova so obviously there is very likely something has been created then we need two neutron stars that need to fight trap each other this is sort of two blind chicken in the desert how likely will they meet Oh, it's a bit, I'm not so happy. And this either or scenario. So I think it's rather an end. It's just a waiting of which scenario towards the other. And obviously supernova type two need to be much more frequent. Okay. So find here the mistakes and I would say at latest this dying low mass stars, this must be dying high mass stars. Maybe there are more hidden. Okay, well, you might now ask here this technetium and promethium. These two elements don't have a stable natural occurring uh, isotope. What we have on the Earth or in the solar system is usually man made. So just to, to give you this feeling. But this is right. Okay, we have seen now basically neutron stars, so pulsar or neutron stars that are still rotating. A bit stuff, it's not a question where do this charged particle come from. Of course, you have constantly some atoms that then get trapped, or atoms that electrons, positrons, maybe electrons from the surface of the of the neutron star. So there are still there is still stuff left, charged particles that then can be accelerated out and produce these jets. Well, there are special cases of of neutron stars which are called magnetars. These are slow rotating neutron stars of frequency of a tenth of a hertz compared to this usual one hertz or this very fast one if you remember all this with 716 hertz but they have extremely strong fields of 100 billion tesla now to give you a feeling what is a tesla if you have i think uh, the earth's magnetic field is something with 10 to the minus 5 if you have one Tesla, it's already extreme strong magnetic field. If you come close to one of these NMR or magnetic resonance imaging uh, magnets, you have about three Tesla fields. So and there you have already a problem. 
when you come close and first of all if you have a pacemaker you should go close the second thing well, i would have my glasses down and the third thing is if you have your wallet that don't mean the coins they are not the problem the problem is if you have their credit card in, it's usually afterwards if you come too close it's white blank that happened to a mate of me an experiment uh, a girl had from another experiment helped us to lift or ask her to help her lift something so we did and then we walked there close to a strong magnetic field and he had his wallet and his credit card in and that later the credit card was uh, white blank but then he was standing in geneva <laughs> with 50 swiss francs in geneva for a week yeah. <laughs> we told him to go and buy for this 50 francs an angling rod so he could eat something <laughs> so at the end we, we we lent him the money but that's of course yeah, it's annoying. So a couple of Teslas are already extreme strong fields. If you get five to ten Tesla, this is enormous. I think fifty to sixty Tesla for a very short time is so about the world record. But there I would have to check what is at the moment. And here we talk about hundred billion Tesla. This means probably all these little neutrons, the magnetic moments aligned. Oh. So to give you this feeling, this is unbelievable. And seemingly about 10% of the neutron stars are magnetar. so one of the spec made the main speculation at the moment is that they are the result of neutron star mergers and then you have these extreme fields towards the end you've seen this uh i in spiraling and some rotation movement and magnets this means something this is probably yeah. you have a quantization axis and then all this is little rotations will align and then whoosh you have this magnetic, massive magnetic fields when everything cools down. So, and then you can imagine you have there something evaporating from the surface. Whoosh! And this will produce massive energies, massive. Even the gravitational redshift will still be in a spectral area of the electromagnetic spectrum. That is relatively high. So these are one of the likely source of gamma ray bursts. So gamma ray again, harder than X rays. And massive intensities of this stuff. So if again something falls in, some metal, this is some, some gas cloud or a small body is getting ripped apart, the dust grain is getting ripped apart into molecules and then oh. so another very extreme object magnetars. But now hopefully at the end of this you know what a pulsar is, a fast rotating neutron star. What the neutron star is, well, you have got a feeling that it's not a homogeneous object, that it also has these layers, but also that we don't really 100% know what they are. And now we come to even more strange objects, black holes. So there's a limit that they default evolve for the, the, the dying star we usually would assume 25 to 30 solar masses but maybe maybe even higher some people say 40 but i would say 30 solar masses this again this is depends who you believe take this as a rough estimate then we don't get go through the stage of a neutron star 
we go to directly to a black hole. And here we are now we can really calculate this gravitational energy that I was previously showing you. So basically again, the one over r potential and here we would calculate the energy. Sorry, I should have waited before until now is calculated as the amount of work so from bottom to the top. We need to invest some work along the way along this force where the force works and this is then usually given as f dr the integral of it and it's in this curve it would be if we plot one over r squared it would be the area between zero and the curve and you see if you go further out here the the, the, the curve the area is drastically increasing you go further here the area becomes smaller this corresponds then to this work plotting in the force we have this one over r squared integration executed that we get minus one over r and the limits from the inner towards the outer plugging this in we end up with this stuff, we could now take the minus sign in and take this over. What we see is the gravitational potential of the gravitational force, so due to the gravitational constant, the one mass, relative towards our mass m, the small m, that the potential of this is this minus g m over r. Or if we plot, plot the potential energy here and the distance towards this object, here is now gift from the Earth, so the Earth radius and then this potential. In order to come away from the Earth potential, we need to go to cross the zero line. We need to invest more energy. Of course, we have a three dimensional object, which means in every direction we can, where we go, we have to go out of this gravitational sink or this energy sink somehow. Well, now we can look at uh, this, this simple expression here and ask ourselves what happens if, if the mass becomes infinite? And obviously this, this, this well gets infinitely deep, even at a, a given uh, distance. Well, what, or what happens if the distance r, what means the surface here becomes uh, very small. So we go here basically towards left and left and left and we see we also go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. This R here is the surface of a given object. It can be a planet, it can be a star, it can be an electrode. Oh, and if we now make this smaller, it's the question how deep is this stuff? So the answer is if M goes towards infinity here, obviously this term here becomes infinite. If R goes towards zero, if you divide a given amount divided by nothing, so it tends towards infinity. So we always get infinity. So what happens with light? Well, previously we had the gravitational, or we had the redshift due to the expansion of the space. We take our, our wave, but then underneath space grows, expands. And the wavelength gets basically expanded with this growth of space underneath. So the emitted wavelengths minus the, uh, the emitted, the observed wavelengths minus the emitted, so the change of the wave, but relative towards the emitted wavelengths, that was our redshift. Now what turns out? If a photon is emitted from an atom or whatever, in a given gravitational potential, 
it then has to work against, well, travels basically perpendicular. It has to work against this gravitational force. It has to work if it's emitted at this stuff here. It has to work its way out of this gravitational thing. It's a strange thing. This is the so-called gravitational redshift. So if a photon is emitted here on Earth and you want to observe it at the ISS 400 kilometers above the Earth, the photon had to work against the gravitation of the Earth. Oh, this is a space curvature of space for 400 or a given amount of energy that gives this energy away. It means its frequency is now a bit lower, it means its wavelength has become longer, it's redshifted. Oh, and in quantum mechanics, this was again this, uh, that the energy corresponds to the, is proportional to the frequency and anti-proportional to the wavelengths. So just remember this. And now what we can do is, of course, conservation of energy. At, at the potential of the emitted wave, then the, plus the energy that is stored in the photon in its given wavelengths corresponds then to the energy that is stored in the photon in the gravitational potential at the observer. So we basically resolve this lambda e divided by lambda of the observer compared to the emitted one. Plug in this gravitational potential that we previously calculated. And what we get is a formula that looks basically this way. Now, interestingly, what happens? What happens? So, one minus something observer, which is less, one minus that is more. So, this here is smaller than up here. This means this will be always larger than one. So, if we multiply the emitted wavelengths over, multiplied with something that is larger than one, the wavelengths that is observed will be longer. Indeed, we have a redshift. Just a bit of mathematical play around. So, <clears throat> Oops. So, and now it becomes interesting. What happens if the radius corresponds exactly to 2g m c squared? This means we get here 1. Then 1 minus 1 is 0. And we divide something by zero. This becomes infinite. Or, when this condition here is fulfilled, the observed wavelength is infinite. We don't have any wavelength. There is no wavelength. So if we emit a photon, at a distance towards the center of a, of a body with a given mass m, right? That corresponds. This here is basically just a factor corresponding of two uh, universal constants. So basically, another universal constant that this radius and this mass. In this moment, the wave is gone. There can no, no wave can uh, propagate out of this potential anymore. So, 
Oop. Go back. So if we have a bit light, if this here is this radius r, and here to work out, we want to observe it infinity, the light has to be work all this way out and then it becomes here infinite the wavelengths so here it's gone and it doesn't matter if it's emitted closer to the object than this re there won't be any wave anymore so there is a radius that is directly proportional to the mass with these proportional factors before from which no wave can escape anymore. No light can escape anymore. If light cannot escape, forget about anything else, because anything else is, is slower. Everything with a mass is slower than the, the rest uh, massless rest or rest massless uh, uh, photon. It won't be observed. Nothing can escape between or oh, under the, if it's emitted from a given mass underneath this certain radius oh, this mass to radius ratio is basically given by this 2g over c squared and we would call this special radius the, the Common literature you usually read about event horizon. I prefer Schwarzschild radius, so black shield radius. Well, this was Karl Schwarzschild. He published this in 1917. Otherwise, he was there busy fighting the Eastern Front in the First World War, but he got basically somehow paper by, by Einstein. From 1915, this general theory of relativity and worked out there must be this uh, radius where nothing can escape. So in each mass has this much radius. But usually, the thing is that the physical extension of this mass is much bigger than this much radius. So light can still escape. If the mass m has a rate, uh, uh, the dimension that is below this is the Schwarzschild radius, it's a black hole. It doesn't matter how big the stuff is, it's just uh, the, how big the mass is, then just this radius scales down. If the mass is below, well, the extension of the mass is below, a point like mass, it will be a black hole. Doesn't matter how heavy it is. Of course, for, for, for heavy mass, this radius is still a bit larger, but for smaller mass, smaller. So essentially, <clears throat> what we get, we have seen that mass deforms space and makes basically this dent. And this dent becomes deeper, the bigger the mass is. And the more or less extended, the larger the object is. Now we basically increase the mass and, and lower the, the, the extension of the object. The stuff becomes deeper and narrower. So for a neutron star, the, the, the photon has to work already quite a lot. You remember the, the escape velocity was a, a third to half the speed of light. Ooh, if the escape velocity becomes the speed of light, black hole. They cannot escape anymore. So, for black hole, we basically have now this deformation at some point so narrow, or the dimension of the object is below, uh, has become so narrow that working from out from here, so here the, the, the light wave becomes more and more and more redshifted until it's basically no wave anymore. What happens with the time? Compared to an observer somewhere without any gravitational potential. Remember, the, the higher the gravitational 
gravity, which means the deeper the gravitation potential, the slower seems the time to, to, to progress. Basically, the slow, slower and slower and slower compared to this other clock, compared to the other clock. That means if you want to freeze something in time, a time capsule, bring it close towards the Schwarzschild radius or this event horizon of a black hole, because there the time is basically not progressing. If the time is not progressing, the speed, oh, this is compared to an observer outside, is basically velocity per time. Time becomes basically infinite. Yeah, it becomes zero. Oh. Stuff that I don't understand or that I just accept. Again. So this event horizon is very crucial. And it's directly proportional to the mass of the body. You can now even calculate this. We take G, we take C. We take, for example, the solar mass. What, how big would be the Schwarzschild radius? So if we make our sun smaller than the Schwarzschild radius, it's a black hole. Oh, if we do so with the sun and calculate it through, I hope this is no, is the units okay? I thought there are problems at some point. Sorry about this. It turns out that the sun has a Schwarzschild radius or event horizon of three kilometers. For six kilometers diameter, if we press it together, it's a black hole. And now you remember 12 to 14 kilometer radius, so four times, and 1.5 to two times the mass of our sun. Neutron stars. They are not far away from the Schwarzschild radius, they are just a bit above. If they would be a bit smaller, there would be black holes. Or black hole looks at the inside. Go to the philosophy department. We cannot test. So, what is quite nice, so since we now know that the, the, the solar mass results in three kilometers, if you have two times the solar mass, the Schwarzschild radius, that's directly proportional. Rs is proportional to the mass, or, or equals a constant 2g over c squared, multiplied the mass. It's brilliant stuff. <laughs> it means this directly scales one to one. If you calculate this now for, for electron, just you need the mass ratio, and then you can directly apply this to three kilometers. Done. So you could calculate for your body the Schwarzschild radius. Or below you are black hole. Of course, they have a bit of a, a, a bad bad reputation as all eating monsters and so on, but oh, you shouldn't come too close to them. If you stay a bit away, then it's fine. So every object can get form a black hole. Sometimes they are super small, sometimes they are massive. And it's not quite interesting. Ha! Ah, one always thinks these are super dense objects. Of course, if you press our sun on the, on the, the radius of, uh, of three kilometers, <laughs> it's a super dense object. But that's not necessarily true. Because oh, I think this is interesting enough to do it. So keep this in mind that the Schwarzschild radius and the solar mass is directly proportional. And quickly switch to the tablet. Check the time for the important. I need later to pick up my son. Okay, so density rho is given as mass 
the volume. Now we say that the maximum volume of this stuff is the volume of the sphere with the Schwarzschild radius of 4 by a third or s to the power of 3. And then we have seen that the mass is proportional to the Schwarzschild radius. Or with this, uh, I think it's C o squared over 2g. Plugging this in here, we get c squared over 8 pi or 3 c squared over 8 pi g r s over r s squared. So, this needs the density is proportional. To 1 over r s squared. Or the bigger, which is then proportional 1 over the mass of the object squared. Because this is directly proportional to each other. The bigger the object, the less the density. If you take no 4 million solar masses, which is about the black hole that we have in the center of our galaxy, of the Milky Way, um, every galaxy seems to have a massive black hole in its center, so millions of solar masses, and calculate there the density, it's less than water. The smaller the object, the more dense it is, the, the bigger it becomes, or the black hole, the bigger it becomes, the less its density. Something that, again, oof. but you see, even I could do this now, and it cannot be that difficult. Oh. That worse to be mentioned. It's always uh, people come up, oh, super dense and whatever, and all eating. And also, not all eating, only if you come too close. No, sorry, need to find here. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> we have now this one, and now let's go a step further. This is this with the electron. So that mass over Schwarzschild radius is just basically this constant, which we can calculate. And there are micro black holes, which we expect that they were there quite after the Big Bang. Maybe they were eating then and became bigger. But, oh, Let's see what, what what's happening in the future, or whether they are what happened to them. We're going to later talk that not even black holes are eternal. So even if all matter would be now in one big black hole in the universe, it wouldn't be the end. They only grow as long as they can eat. Afterwards, they slim down. Well, what was quite interesting here, so now I would recommend you, if you want, you can have a bit of a break with some films. I know this was a lot of formula and stuff, that's why I usually, if this would be a one-to-one -one face to face lecture towards the end, I rather want to have you watching than something and, and it relax your mind after three hours of waffling and also my, my voice. Okay, what's quite nice is here this uh, paranoia before the LHC became online. There. People were scared there would be a micro black hole that, that starts to feast. And then you see what happens in the area of the LHC. So near the Lake Geneva, you see CERN, uh, the ring of the LHC before the French Jura. The black hole and it starts feasting and then it starts feasting and feasting and feasting and what happens to the earth? So just for your enjoyment. 
and then you can also then see uh, how can we detect basically uh, black holes, for example, via this Einstein bricks. So this is here, nice video. And here is something with the true Einstein ring. So basically, black hole passes before Uncle Albert. And I would say enjoy all these uh, videos. I will now again stop this here. And uh, then the last 14 slides after a bit of a break. Now uh, you realize today I want to have a bit more breaks because occasionally check the news and so I take this video at the moment. Uh, this morning was the day when the Russians invaded Ukraine, and I'm really scared how things will escalate. So that's why I want to check more and more the news. Okay. See you later for the question whether we can observe them really and how do we observe them. So what happens if an object comes to close? See you then in the next video.